Well, good afternoon to you all. Yeah, I think so. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, uh, some quick announcements. One is on the attendance sheet today, I've actually taken an inventory of the write-ups that I've received so far for each of you. So uh, my filing system and my clerical skills are not 100% accurate. So if I've missed something, please let me know. Um, and uh, if, on the other hand, uh, I'm accurate, uh, some of you have actually done three write-ups already. Congratulations. And some of you have yet to start. So assuming I'm accurate, uh, you know, now or soon would be a good time to get started. Um, so I will, I'll circulate this and pass that around. Uh, next week, uh, we've had a, a complication arise, and I actually would like your input uh, to what we do to resolve it. Uh, we're scheduled to have a speaker from Harvard Business School come, uh, but he has had a conflict come up that's made it impossible for him to be able to fly here uh, to do the seminar next week. He is willing to do it by video, so that's one option, to do it by video. We think the room can support it. We've not done it before, so uh, no promises on how flawless that will be, but should be possible. So that's choice A. Uh, choice B, after going through the feedback forms from a couple of weeks ago, uh, a number of you expressed an interest in kind of hearing more uh, of a lecture about open innovation from me. And so I could do a lecture next week and actually have some time for just questions and interaction with you as well. Uh, I would not be by videotape. I would be here. <laughs> uh, and that is choice B. Uh, we have not come up with a choice C. So we have really either of those two choices. So I'm going to take a vote in just a moment. But in my experience, when I put a choice in front of these bright young minds, somebody always has a question. So are there any questions before I take your preferences on choice A versus choice B? No questions. It was that clear. OK, fantastic. How many of you would like to go for choice A? Nice and high, nice and high. Uh, how many of you uh, would choice B? How many of you really don't care? <laughs> OK, so uh, I, I guess the Bs have it. Uh, and we will inflict. Uh, a full strength open innovation presentation upon you next week, uh, suitable for write up, um, and we'll go that way. So, thank you for your input there. Uh, we are working on trying to get some more chairs, and they appear to be arriving one or two at a time. So, for those of you who are sitting on the floor, my apologies. Ah, right on cue. Fantastic. Uh, so, with that, let me introduce uh, our speaker today. Uh, Stephen Friend and I are just getting to know each other. But I already know that he is doing some amazing stuff, opening up the innovation process in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, he's going to describe his background to you. He is somebody who has been at many parts of the value chain, uh, from basic academic research all the way through to clinical and drug development activities, uh, and is taking this knowledge to really transform the way pharmaceuticals are going to be developed in the future. Uh, to give you a couple of quick uh, facts to set the stage, last year, for the first time in memory, total R&D spending in the pharmaceutical industry went down, not up. Also, the number of new chemical entities, meaning new compounds that are getting approved uh, over a 25-year period are on a downward trend while R&D spending, except for this past year, has been on a very sharp upward trend. So we're getting, spending more and more and getting less and less out of it uh, in terms of input. So this is truly a model ripe for new thinking. Are those compounds, um, are those compounds approved by the FDA? Is that what you mean? Yes. By? Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. These are uh, authorized by the Federal Food and Drug Administration. Um, so. Uh, the current model, uh, many would agree, is not sustainable. What's much less clear is what comes after. Uh, and with that as an introduction, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, and enlighten us with uh, the, the great work that you're doing. And well, thank you for being here. 
a pleasure. Um, it's really a pleasure. I don't often get to speak career. Um, I think the people who are in the room are the, the most likely to be able to do what needs to be done, and I feel that here. Um, I uh, started out in a very odd area in philosophy, anthropology, then I did uh, biophysics and MD degree, and then I was a pediatric oncologist, and then spent three blocks of time that I think have made an impact or at least made a, a difference in sort of how, what my vision is. Um, I was at uh, MIT and uh, the Whitehead Institute uh, had a, a chance to help clone out, the, lead the team that cloned out the first cancer susceptibility gene. It was 86, how long ago that was. Um, and I um, stayed on the faculty there at uh, Mass General. Then I, um, in the uh, 97 uh, time frame, thought that biotech was a better way to work on things and was lucky enough to help start up a company in Seattle named uh, Rosetta Informatics that um, Lee Hartwell, Lee Hood, and I uh, started. And in 2001, uh, sold that to uh, Merck for, on the bubble, for about uh, $700 million. And then spent eight years uh, in industry um, uh, at a senior leadership level in pharma, 50,000 people organization, um, where I had a chance to sort of see what it's like to work on battleships. I mean, these are big battleship flotillas, pharma companies are. And the reason I bring it up is in each instance, if you go down the hallway, there's a similar concept that we're doing the thing that's going to matter. It's really interesting. You go into an academic place, we're the ones that are going to solve it. <laughs> Biotech, absolutely. But I think most people don't realize that people who work in uh, industry think that they are the ones that are needed to be able to do that. And I think they actually they're all needed and they're all incorrect that they're doing it in the correct way. And what I'm going to talk about today is the absurdity at which most of these people go about their lives if you pull back, look from above at how academia, how biotech, and how industry. I, I, don't, have, I don't have a favorite here. Um, why do I feel that way? Uh, I think uh, uh, Henry's uh, point on the um, difficult situation uh, can uh, be complemented by framing it this way. Go to any disease that someone in your family has and ask whether the drugs that they're getting are successfully modifying their disease. Okay? We live in a society that is capable of shifting disease back, and yet most patients have two things. Either they're getting a drug that's actually just treating their symptoms, not actually uh, modifying the disease. And let's take a billion dollar drug. Let's take a statin, okay? cholesterol lowering drug, all touted as the type of drug you wish you could make. So statins, 40% of the patients who get those have cholesterol lowered, and 40% of those end up having any benefit in terms of heart attacks. Okay? So three out of four patients who take a drug that everyone thinks they should be taking is having any benefit. Does anyone stop to figure out who should be getting it? So there are two themes here that are the reality. You know, if you strip away the, isn't, aren't we doing amazing things? Bottom line is we're treating symptoms, not modifying diseases. And if you ask, is that drug likely to work uh, for, uh, for a particular person, it's always, there's a statistical significance in giving this drug, not, is it going to work for you, is it going to work for you, okay? That's what people should demand. I'm going to talk about five things, and you can tell where I am, and I'm going to try to see how fast I can go, which is pretty fast, and I'm going to try to get done so that there's an hour and 15 minutes where we really have the dialogue. I'm going to give you a primer, and instead of going, oh, there's a question here or there, I'm going to try to zip through it so we can go back, because I'm going to be talking. Some things people already know, some things don't. But so that everyone's on an even keel, I'm going to zip through this uh, presentation, and then let's open up. Let's have a really fun uh, dialogue. So I'm going to talk about how you build models of disease, what's wrong with the current ones. I'm going to talk about why we can't build them the way uh, I think uh, one could. Uh, what is this organization called SAGE Bionetworks? 
I want to go through six real examples of innovation pilots that we put out there. We expect 50% of them to fail. And I want to go in, which ones do you think are going to fail? Which ones do you think are going to work? We will know right, in the next two years. And then I want to um, go to really where the dialogue is. That's not actually stuff I'm going to go through, which is next steps. You can go through Harvard Business Review, I have. Um, you can go to The Economist, I have. And look at why it is that hundreds of billions of dollars get spent each year. And to your point, it's about 30 compounds that get approved by the FDA. Okay? It's not even 30 new uh, mechanisms. It's 30 that actually were decided, oh, it's a good second uh, iteration. So hundreds of billions of dollars feed out uh, a pipeline of about uh, 30. And I think the easiest way to frame it is to acknowledge that most of the therapies that are out there were assumed that you could take a single pill that you could buy, a physician could write, and that that single pill would actually miraculously shift you from X to Y. And it assumed that if you had a study where you did 1,000 patients and there was a better benefit for those, that everyone had an equal chance of getting a benefit out of a drug. So the trials that get uh, built are ones that say, how can I find statistics as if there were no individuals in that group, as if there was homogeneity in the disease. I'm going to show you that's not true. And the other is that if you go, well, then let's go back and look at the models that we use. So when I say model, what I mean is representation of a disease. So a model of a disease, what I'm referring to is how could I build a, a mental construct is it the proteins? What is it, the, the construct? And our existing disease models often assume that pathway knowledge, and I'll show you what I mean by a pathway, is sufficient to infer correct therapies. So I want to know how many people have had to sit in a boring lecture somewhere in their life that sort of has this type of, you know, there's the cell surface, and there are these proteins and these arrows. I call this the stick and ball model. So how many people have seen a model like this? Okay. I grew up, right, because I was in biochemistry, biophysics, thinking, God, if I could just, we could just have this image and this knowledge for our disease, we could go in and go, ah, there's a drug, in fact, that is a drug, that will work, and all we need to do is take a disease, figure out where the error is, and that this simple uh, concept, familiar but incomplete, is what we should be, as scientists, trying to develop. There's... This is the first of about 10 take-home lessons. First take-home uh, lesson, okay? For any pathway, we as organisms have been able to be equipped by, through evolution to basically ward off any single change that happens in our cells, in our bodies, in our tissues. And in fact, for any one of those pathways that you draw in that sort of pretty way that goes up, it's usually on a thesis or maybe it's on professors you know, who got tenure, I, I figured this protein out, um, that actually for any one of those, there are overlapping pathways that are compensating and actually keeping you from tipping off if any one change happens. So the complexity of the cells that we hadn't been able to recognize in the 80s and 90s is just coming down on us in terms of ways that we don't know what to do with it. And here is where my phrase alchemy came from. Um, if you go to cancer, um, there are articles you can look up, Weinberg, Hanahan, Google that, and you'll get this diagram that says, well, yeah, but the whole cancer cell can be uh, organized into, this to me looks like a horoscope, incidentally, um, uh, about six different errors that are in the cell. This is one about cell death, this is cell cycle, here's even a, like a Christian cross up here. Um, and then every five years, there comes a new circle, this is the more recent horoscope, the 2011 Weinberg Hanahan uh, description. And there's a concept that if we, you know, we're so close to knowing what's really going on. So the reason I put this picture of the alchemist is that's exactly the way the chemists thought before there was a periodic table. Okay? You went in the 1600s, you went to Padua or someplace like that, and you went into someone's shop, they said, oh, I know everything about chemistry. I take this yellow, I take this uh, earth compound, and I, I can make that turn blue for you. Okay? We have to remember that's the level that our medical science is. Western medical science, okay? Epitome quote of where we are is sitting there. And until 
we have a way to have something equivalent to a periodic table that says, here is what the patient has, here is what my therapy is, and I get a certain amount of certainty from that. Okay. We're going to continue to um, be puzzled, spend significant amounts of money, and not be able to make progress. And I wouldn't bring this up, except this is a pretty cool age. We're about to go into the next 10, 20 years where the whole thing is going to blow up the way we think of what goes on inside a cell. And I think many of you, probably half the people who are in the engineering side, or maybe it was the half of the people who are in the business side, know this. Um, there's a beautiful paper. You can uh, download it, um, actually, in its entirety. Uh, there's no IP on it, by an uh, author who is at uh, Microsoft, a guy named Jim Gray. It was a really co interesting concept of how science goes on. And he said there are four paradigms in science. Three of them we've used extensively. The fourth is the important one. So I'm not going to go through these because you can go online and get it. But basically, there's empiric, looking at natural phenomenon. There are theoretical branches of science where you use models, generalizations. And then uh, 20th century was known for computational branches, simulating complex phenomena. The problem is that when you get beyond simple organisms like yeast, things like that, um, we don't know enough to be able to actually use the component equation strategy that sits in what I call the bottoms up systems biology approaches that sit there in the computational branch. But when you have a, you know, awesomely hard problem that needs to be solved. What has worked in physics, it's worked in astronomy, um, um, it has um, uh, been, been possible to do in, in some parts of science, is to capture massive amounts of data, <laughs> process that, and to generate hypotheses and then go back and validate those hypotheses. So if you want to know how Amazon Reader Advantage works, or if you want to know what Google is doing on its search, this is what they're using. They're using the fourth paradigm. Okay? And what I'm going to talk about is how you use the fourth paradigm in medicine. Are we ready to use the fourth paradigm that actually people have put an awful lot of money into getting to work? What keeps us from doing data exploration? Incidentally, this really irritates the biochemistry professor who spent their whole life working on four molecules. Okay. It's like, where's the hard facts? Okay. So what do you need to do this fourth paradigm? Data intensive science is a good uh, uh, word for it. Well, you need to have equipment generating massive amounts of data. I bring this up because up until recently, we didn't. <laughs> There was a stethoscope, there was a CBC, there was a history. Okay, this is not massive amounts of data. Secondly, you have to have some way of moving that data around, IT interoperability. Third, you can move it around, but if, as I'll show you, we live and we do in a closed medical information system, it's not going to do much good to have the interoperability. And then fourth, and this is going to be one of the key points I go to, you have to have a compute space capable of allowing you to have generative models. You have to have a space where you go beyond the linear. You have to have some space where someone has one idea, they go and work on it from another, and they be able to evolve it. So sitting um, just north of here, um, I think it is north of here, um, is the radiation lab. Fortunately, um, I got to see that 30, 40 years ago when my father-in-law worked in the uh, Berkeley radiation labs. And the physicists made this transition between 30 and 50 years ago. If you look at what happened from Rutherford or um, Cavendish working in Oxbridge, doing things on their lab benches, the way things are done now, there was a transition from small to big science where the concept was, whether it's the CERN Collider or the new um, accelerator being built in China, the concept is get serious amounts of data and put it out there, be able to share it, and work on those uh, projects um, uh, in, in this sort of building, building hypotheses. So again, hey, others are doing it. Why don't we? What would happen if we tried to use data-intensive science to build better disease maps? In the last uh, 
five plus years. So it was really 2001, you may know, the first uh, human uh, genome was uh, gloriously announced as being sequenced. And now you know that um, there are companies in the Bay Area that will do your sequence for somewhere around $5,000, okay? It costs a couple of hundred million dollars. It's at 5000 Anyone who doubts that it's going to hundreds of dollars, okay, should skip the thousand uh, uh, price mark. One thing, the head of uh, BGI, Beijing Genome uh, uh, Institute, um, who's on our board at SAGE, is working on a project in China where they have a village and they've decided to sequence the village. Guess how big the village is? They're going to sequence the entire village. It's one million people. They're going to sequence a million, okay? We're not ready to know what to do with the type of information we're going to have, okay? okay? You're lucky. You're sitting there on the edge of, what am I going to do in my life to be able to take advantage of this type of thing? We're being able to pull out DNA, RNA, protein. There's this stuff called dark matter. I think they just borrowed it from the physicists, but it's basically all the things that they don't know what it's doing where it isn't uh, coding. Um, I wonder who the physicists borrowed that from. Um, but the thing that I will go to is Altered component lists, which is the mantra these days, figure out all the alterations, will not tell us uh, what we want to do. So when I was in Seattle at Rosetta, um, part of Merck, about 10 years ago, we, got, we were lucky enough to be given, this is about open innovation, we were given $150 million and asked, can we build a probabilistic causal model of a mammalian disease? Okay, that, right, so I said, this is how much it's going to cost. Let's see if we can build a probabilistic causal model of, of a disease. And we chose, you know, whether we worked with changes in DNA, do we take clinical data, proteomics, and we decided to just do it with three layers, DNA, RNA, and uh, clinical uh, data. And the result, which took three years to do, was first done in mice, and then we went and pulled in, it's a pretty nice experiment, all the data on an entire country. We went to uh, Iceland and we pulled in all the genomic data in, in the country. Expression profiling, looked at uh, um, data on uh, a DNA and said, let's take a disease like obesity and let's see if we can build a rank ordered list of the genes that are most likely to shift the disease state, not modify, but shift the disease state from A to B. This list of uh, 10 genes in this Nature Genetics uh, article had nine of the 10 that were able to be validated. That was unheard of. So the concept of being able to go in and say for a particular disease, here are potential targets for, gene, for, for, for developing therapies began. And now um, there are probably, um, you, you know the world of synthetic biology. It, grew up actually about the same time, but in this area of what I call top-down, data-intensive science, there are about 30, 50 groups in the world that do this type of work now. And um, they sort of take different approaches. Um, if you go on our website, uh, sagebase.org, you can go in and pull down 50 to 100 of these papers. We list the ones that we think are the 10 most important. They all say one thing, this is take-home message number two. Our brains are hardwired for the narrative. We love storytelling. We like this, goes to this, goes to that. Okay? The cell does not work that way. The cell behind anything that you might draw in your ball stick uh, character actually has an entire network of regulators, ways to turning things on, turn things off, that are relatively invisible from the classic concept of ball stick biochemical, but actually it's places like this where there is uh, evolution, uh, basically uh, we got a little lax, got a little sloppy, and made it such that if you pound on that, then there are changes that shift the, the system. It's a lack of redundancy in certain parts. So that's a question now about like how could we, how could we build these? Right? So I've now talked about building models of disease. And I'm going to talk about how, how can you build those. And if you uh, assume like we're in a university and you give a scorecard, I don't know if you still work on A's or F's. Um, this is the scorecard if you're an easy grader. Equipment capable of generating the amounts of data, we've got it. Okay, I think that that's not going to be the rate limiting step. It's 
getting better and better. I'm not worried about uh, being able to get the data out there, even on proteins, on metabolomics, on methylation, and things like that. IT interoperability, we suck. I, open information sec, uh, systems were worse. But actually, and it's pretty interesting, up until about two years ago, there was no, zero, that's why you get an F, <laughs> no place where if you were actually had an idea and you wanted to work on it, similar to what the synthetic biologists have when they want to go and share a project and share reagents, there was no place where you could say, I want to work with you. Our system it's, um, was, uh, um, I need to hold something so I have to keep this uh, stupid cap. Thanks. Um, um, our whole system is pay someone to generate some data, have them analyze it, have them publish a paper, have some other group come in and knock them off. Okay? Not, hey, I'm working on this and you're working on that, therefore let's work together. Incident, in, interestingly, unless you're in industry. Okay? Industry kicks butt on that, okay? It knows what it's doing within a company, okay? So I'm gonna now give you seven things that prevent us from being able to share these models. So the first is our culture, okay? We, in science, act like we're hunter-gatherers, okay? We say, you're the person, you go off, you get this, you bring the meat back, and after you get done with it, give the scraps to others, okay? That's the way the academic system works, okay? Not, let's team up, let's work together. When you go to choose where you're going to do a postdoc or where you're going to get a faculty position, you should look around and see what's the best feudal state. This is out of Warhammer. You, know? you, you should go. Who's got the most resources? Who's got that? Because once you get in one of those castles, you're competing with another place. If you go, I'm going to the Broad, I'm going to Stanford, I'm going here, the concept is, uh, we're going to beat the others and we'll uh, make sure we get our ranking. So it's not necessarily the way patients would uh, consider that that was a good way. So I think <laughs> academia, you guys are in a feudal state, okay? You're alchemists and you're living in a feudal state. And you're monkeys, no, I'm just kidding, sorry. <laughs> the next one is, you know, we, I, I come up the roads here in Berkeley and it's just the place where there's, you know, containers for, what is it? Um, colored trash, paper trash, white paper trash, da da da. But when it comes to being responsible from an environmental, from an ecologic standpoint, pretty odd, clinical genomic data. And again, this is different from the way mathematicians, physicists, and actually, again, some of my heroes, synthetic biologists do it. Clinical genomic data is basically, a fair amount is accessible, but it's not very usable. You don't want someone to repeat what you did. You're, you're better off having to have them go from scratch, because then you have an advantage. One of the big problems with having um, uh, compounds that actually are looked at for being used by another. Um, taking and asking are there compounds that, that could be used in another. Is it actually, you don't want them to get an advantage. And so there's little incentive to annotate, to curate data for other scientists to use. In fact, it's built the op opposite way. Um, the, the next of the problems is that to do this type of work requires um, not building some sort of bricks and mortar. It, it requires building mathematical models. And again, similar to the data, what you'd like people to do is uh, say, oh, that's a good paper in Nature or Cell, um, or I got an IP, you know, I got my IP, I started my company, but I don't want to show you what I really did. <laughs> And worse, I don't, I don't want someone else to be able to go in and necessarily reproduce it. Um, I'm better off if I own that myself, I keep that to myself. So not very open innovation. Mo mathematical models of disease in, in, in this area of uh, biology, um, clinical, uh, medical, um, is basically not built to be reproduced or versioned by others. Um, the, Forms that we use for consents, and this is something, I'm going to give six examples later. Um, when we get to it, one of the biggest barriers is that actually when we look at how forms are put together for people in the future being able to, to work with data, um, there are no standard forms. Um, the next to the last is that if you look at what the four universities worked on in the DARPA project that built the intranet, they worked on standardization. 
The reason why the data flows, the reason why the internet works is you know when you do this, this is going to happen. And the opposite is a world in, of clin uh, clinical medical information because hospitals don't want anyone to really know what they're doing. The doctors don't really want to show what they're doing. The academic institutions are fine not being able to um, have others uh, work on that. And then you get all the way through, and tell me industry has got it uh, standardized? They don't either. So last one, which I think is actually the most important one. I grew up in America, and, and we would go, oh, we have such a free system here. Um, God, thank God we don't live in East Germany. This is a picture of East Germany. And today, um, we look at uh, Iran, and we go, God, the people there live in such a strange world. They can't share data. This is a, a beautiful uh, site that shows um, how you could share data um, in Tehran uh, during the, the uh, um, Arab Spring uh, revolutions. And I think uh, inappropriately, as a uh, resident of Beijing myself, uh, some people go, oh, what is this going on in China? How is it that the internet is so closed? We, we would never live in a system like that, right? What I'm going to tell you is that the information system that we work with, medical information system, is as closed as the others. Okay? This is from the Stanford uh, Medical School website on what you can and cannot do when you live in silos, okay? Our minds, like those of the people in those other countries, thought it was okay to live this way for a common good, for a better good, okay? I don't think it's for the better good in any of those places. <laughs> but let's not point fingers unless we look at how it is that we ourselves uh, work with open data and, and what we're doing. So two and a half years ago, um, I left uh, Merck because I thought, wow, these models are pretty interesting, and no one company, no one organization can possibly uh, do it. What happens if we could build a space in which patients said, hey, I'm really glad there's a space out here where you could build those disease models, and actually the purpose of it, this is very important, the purpose of it is so that other people can actually gain IP, work on things that are important. I'm, I'm not suggesting that incentives can't be around the reward structure. You have to build something that actually benefits all, particularly the patients, to be able to do it. So where are we now? We are about, um, as I said, two and a half years in. We have 35 people in uh, Seattle. We have some people in Beijing and in Amsterdam. Um, we have about um, 25 million in funding. We have 11 pharma companies that work with us. We have a third of that money comes from pharma. The one rule is we don't generate any data. Any data that gets given to us and we build a model, we put out in the public domain. It's pretty interesting that industry is willing to work with us even though they know. And what we say is during the project time, we're not going to uh, divulge anything. You can have up to a year afterwards, but then it all goes in the public domain. So they get what they want. We get what we want, the public gets what, 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 what they want. Um, and um, I think that's enough said on that. Um, for the scientists, in one minute, I just want to show, there's these beautiful models that I'd be glad to talk later about people, where you can go into Alzheimer's, thought to be plaque, working with um, uh, looking at uh, A beta levels and things like that. And we can build these circuitry models that showed um, beautiful targets that could be done. Um, you can go into diseases like obesity that I was talking about and look at the relationships between the brain and the liver and the fat and, and stuff, again, that I'm not going to take time to do. What I'm saying is you can build those models of uh, disease that give you insight. I want to talk about a platform, the compute space, and then I want to talk about the six pilots so then we can uh, have time to, to talk about things. Um, how many people in here have been or know about GitHub? Okay, so that's good. So three or four. So GitHub did not exist four or five years ago. Um, actually, someone should uh, ch fact check me on that. I'm using it a lot right now, and so someone let me know at the end whether that's longer. Um, GitHub was built for bringing teams together to build projects in software, either as closed teams, so Microsoft Team or something like that could get on and use it, or all the way through to Unix, totally open systems. What it said was, um, for us to ha have a site, you put your project on there, you define like Google Circles. Who is, is not going to be on that project. And most importantly, what it uh, uh, does is 
it shows you a way of having all the versioning, all the um, places where uh, data is stored, such that um, you have, sh this is third important point, you have shifted recognition and reward from being end product to work. Very important. You have made it so that when someone gets on and adds something in the middle of a process, they get credit for that. Not who was the person who oversaw the project or what was it that happened as the last step. And now um, most companies hire people by virtue of the fact of what, have, what has that software engineer done on GitHub, not what's their resume. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about now is how can we change universities so that actually it's not about what's in your CV, it's not about your citation index, it's actually what the heck did you do? Not what did your postdoc do in your lab, not about proxy schemes, it's what did you do and are you still doing it? What's your value uh, to, 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 to society? And so to do that, we looked at, um, the nice thing is, this is a project, and if you're th thinking of uh, open innovation, this is like uh, maybe uh, take home lesson number three. Never create when you can borrow, steal, or use from someone else. No, seriously, it's like stupid, okay? Um, one of the other, I, I mentioned one of my, uh, the board members, second board member, which I think is just so awesome, this guy, Jeff Hammerbacher, who was the data architect at Facebook, employee number th uh, five, you may know, um, he um, hated classes. He dropped out of Harvard, went to Bear Stern, then he went to Facebook, now he runs a place named Cloudera. He's finally 28. And he uh, decided that he hated classes, so you know where he is? He's actually, I don't know if you know this, he's on the faculty at the business school at, uh, here at Berkeley teaching a class because he said, I hated classes, <laughs> right? So maybe if I can't, you know, let's eat our own dog food. Can I make a class that someone actually likes to go to, okay? And if I can't, then I can say this shouldn't be. So anyway, um, he was one of the people who uh, basically said, don't go out there and design a this or that. Look at everything that's out there from things that Microsoft and Amazon have done to Google and others and actually put together that platform literally leveraging everything that had already been done for the software engineer world and see if you could actually do it for, for, for biologists. So the project that we've been building over about a year and a half is something called Synapse. And I'm not going to, uh, I was going to show some slides. We can, I want to go back to these, but so I finish. The point is very simple. Anyone who does anything can be tracked. We store it up on the, in the cloud at Google and at Amazon who really like these projects and they help us do it. And so anytime you're in the middle of a project, the idea is when you go um, home at night, someone someplace else in the world can pick that up and go, oh, you forgot to do this. Okay? So that's the concept is having a, a way to move a project forward um, where um, basically, you know, watch what I do, not what I say. Um, remember, 99% of the world don't work with you. So how do you make it so they'll actually work with you? Is you show them what you're doing. Don't worry about it. Um, the other computer, right, is uh, a big one. Um, so you know, there's stupid to sit there and talk about how many CPUs you have for your own storage. And this is a project that just came out last week and was in the news. Amazon just built a new uh, 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 product, which this is important for the geeks, allows you to point to data and not pull it into where you want to compute. It's a really interesting concept. So imagine a way where you don't pull the data that you're interested in, but you point to it and you compute uh, down here. Very powerful as you need petabyte amounts of data. So um, Sage uh, uh, said, let's take all the data that's out there on expression. There's a place called uh, Geo, which has all the expression profiling done. And we said, let's pull it into Synapse. Huh? <laughs> and let's curate it, let's annotate, let's make it available for, for uh, others. To do that, we use this Am Amazon Simple Workflow. And in terms of the timing on this, um, if you haven't heard about it, it's because it's not released. Um, we're doing internal alpha, beta testing will be in the third quarter. And, but we have um, DARPA calling us saying, would you like to work with us? We have pharmaceutical companies. We have the uh, country, Norway, interested. So we're looking at how to build out this project called Synapse. So now, 
to the six, and then uh, I think uh, I'm going to do these uh, briefly because I want you to vote or to say or whatever what you want to work on. So, what we talk about. So the first, now, now we're going to take synapse. We're going to take some other things that we have, and we're going to go play. We're going to go. What can you do? What can't you do? So the first project is called CTCAP, Clinical Trial Comparator Arm Partnership. I worked in uh, pharma, and I knew that you can't ever ask a company for their investigational uh, arm of their drug. That's how they make their uh, living. But what most people don't know is that half of the trial is actually not on the investigational arm. They have to do a comparator arm that's either a placebo or a standard of care or um, a, 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 a sort of well-known compound. And so we said, hey, went to all these companies, said, would you be willing to give us half your data? Huh? Would you give us a trial? And the reason is the clinical trial data is superb. It's well organized. It's supposed to be, is given to the FDA. And so what the, the brilliant, uh, unexpected here, seven of the eight companies said, I will. I'll give you one example of that. So I will, um, again, something we can go back to. This is called the Clinical Trial Comparator Project. We're now working with the FDA and industry to ask, why can't we do it in a therapeutic area? Why can't we make it so every phase two trial <laughs> gets dropped in that way? What's, right? Now that you've given us, you know you can, how do we do that? Second project oops, is called Arch to POCM. We're not marketing, right? We could use some marketing people. But um, this is about, so this is a, a question of, can, can we like cut the cost of drug discovery by a, basically somewhere between uh, five-fold and an order of magnitude? Like, let, let's see what, would, what it would take to do that. So what we chose to do was take two very high-risk areas. Um, one was, by high risk, I mean unlikely to make a drug. So we went and we thought, Autism and schizophrenia, pretty hard disease. And you never know whether you're actually making the drug you want until it works in a patient. You can't do some animal testing. Is that an autistic uh, mouse there? It, it doesn't work. Not even beagles, not even sheep. Um, and so um, we thought, you know, can we de-risk for industry new mechanisms? In autism, schizophrenia, and then there's another area, which I won't go why, uh, through why, which actually has to do with, in oncology, there are all these new chromatin modification changes the structure of DNA targets that actually are important in oncology and immunology. So we said, um, how do we de-risk these high therapeutic areas? And if you want to go back to this, I'll, I'll give you the punchline that we can spend time on. What we realized is that industry would pay to be in a public-private partnership um, Social philanthropists would come in and public funders would come in to take a pair of molecules all the way through to phase 2B trials, the in, uh, safety trials, sharing all the data, no IP on it, so that companies, biotech and pharma, could actually live off the common stream. The concept is literally pour the water down the center and let anyone dip into it and then develop their own IP, their own proprietary molecules off of it. So many drugs sit there one off from the one that was the first one. So our idea was let's de-risk and then come back and let others uh, um, uh, live off that. It really would change, if, if they did it for all the types of, of uh, programs, it would be great. So I'm not going to go through that. Um, I'm going to skip these slides. This is if you decide to come back to this. This is um, like a, a sushi conveyor belt. We can come back and pick this again. It's, it's I should also say we're going to post these on our website uh, afterward, too. So for those of you, if we don't get back to it today, but you want to see it, you'll be able to go scroll through yourself. Um, the next pilot is one that uh, is from Star Trek. So he said, there is this federation, uh, independent states. They're all, all, let's take five labs that all compete with each other, who are each trying to get the nature uh, paper, the science paper. And let's ask them if they want to join <laughs> together and actually beat everyone else. So the idea was most collaborations are done by um, sort of, I'll take someone who knows how to do this and this and this, and we'll pull our labs together. That's what's called a collaboration. A different collaboration is to say, let's open up all the data, all the models, all the tools among some labs, and let's beat the pants off of everyone else. 
Okay? So if you each have something to offer, why don't you pool together You're in different universities? So we took Atul Butte at Stanford, Andrea Califano at Columbia, Trey Eidegger, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, down at UCSD, Eric Schott is at Mount Sinai, and we said, let's try a project that no one thinks you could do, and let's see if we could pull it off and sort of set a standard, and if we do, then other labs will start wanting to come in and be a part of it. So again, just as an advertisement, we said, hey, I think people age at different rates. There's by a chronologic age, but sometimes you look at someone um, George Bush, before and after their presidency, and you see that actually they seem to have aged pretty quickly. Um, maybe, actually, we don't all go through life at the same pace. And so we used you know, chips that had 450,000 markers for methylation. This article just went into Nature uh, uh, last week. Um, and um, can we build a signature that says, Simple thing. This, this could be $20 uh, on the open market, incidentally. Okay? Interesting to think of what you'd do if you had this. And could we look at why? So the first thing we found was that women are aging slower than men. Okay? You knew it, okay? but it's true. It's not that sort of uh, put something on your face at night stuff. They're, they're actually aging uh, slower than, than, than men. Um, diabetes, you age much quicker. There are all these things that we began to learn. So the, the point is that that was done by taking labs that usually competed with each other and just under an agreement. There's a thing called federation principles that we set up. And the nice thing is we took from the physicists this strategy called S-weave or sweave, which is how do you track your workflow so that at the end we could just literally, the paper that we wrote um, took stuff from here, 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 submitted the paper without uh, worrying about how, how we did that. Um, I'm going to skip this whole thing. It's for the, those who want to come back. I have to go to this one, though. I think I have two more before we open up. Um, right now, whenever a patient enrolls in a clinical study, they say, I'm giving part of myself, and in return, I, I'm giving up all my rights. Okay? Everywhere in the world. Right? If you enter a clinical study, whether it's an academic institution, whether it's in um, uh, Egypt or Norway, you say, and here, I hereby give up my right to get any of the data uh, uh, back. The problem with this is that the institutions that get this have to be held responsible by their internal review board, their ethics board, to not share that, because who knows what would be a bad use of that material. Because it's a third party that holds it for all the trials, they have to be held in tow in a very tight way. So the thought we had was, and this is John Wilbanks, who uh, uh, is just uh, down the road now um, in, uh, in Oakland, working as part of his time at SAGE. Um, he said, imagine a world where when I give a sample to someone else, I have a consent that says, I'll give you the sample. You must give all the data back. Imagine if we lived in a world where, hey, I'm giving you a sample. Why don't I get my data back? Okay? This is one of those denial things that until you think about it, we're living in a strange world where we feel completely comfortable giving someone else and saying, it's yours. Why don't we demand that that is ours? Why? Not that we could understand it. Not that we're going to go, ah, oh, now I know I shouldn't have pizza on Thursday night. It's more that that could be then given to another and shared. So if you want to build a system for sharing, what you do is you change the control structure back to the patient. The patient wants to do things, then they can share or, or, or not. And again, I'm not going to go through those uh, slides. Um, I think this is the last uh, two. The next to the last one, I just want to pull out one here. So um, in April, we're going to announce a project that just sort of tells you the kinds of things we're doing. Um, patients with Parkinson's um, have uh, severe disease. So we said, let's get 50 to 200 of them who are willing to have their whole genome sequenced, all this data generated with them, and followed longitudinally, and put their real names and put it in the public domain. Let's break the rule, OK? Let's set up a way where their name is out there. It's not about de-identifying or re-identifying. They've said, I live on this street, this is me, this is my sequence, this is my data, because they want to actually have their disease solved. 
And so you go to a place where they really care about it. Um, incidentally, BGI is doing the sequencing on, on that one. And uh, so I think uh, we can talk about that type. And I just want to end with one last thing, because I said I'd uh, have at least, an, I thought, even longer. I'm going to go to the final solution, and then you can go back to it. So the problem with what we've constructed so far is Synapse, as a compute space, is a powerful place to build models. But we know that the people who really want the change are actually citizens and patients. And that's, remember, all of us will be a patient. The sooner we realize we are all patients and not just, oh, it's them over there, okay? All of us start acting as if we're patients. And patients start going, I want my disease to be solved. Then there is energy into the system. I think we live in a medical industrial complex. All these people are doing quite well. Go back and read the 1961 uh, document uh, Eisenhower, who was a general, wrote on the military-industrial complex. Those military-industrial complexes live in superpowers. So do the medical-industrial complexes. The academic institutions um, may be a little wobbly, but I don't think they're going away. The pharmaceutical companies are making significant money. Physician scientists are looping around. If you look at the social value chain, is that something that's in the best interest of the patient, to not share that, to do that in a linear way, to hoard that, things like that? There's no question it's not. So the real question is, how do you make a system where you could build something where a citizen or a patient could go in and say, I would like a scientist or a funder to work on a project I care about? Or a scientist could go in and say, not from the NIH or some government, say, hey, I have a problem I think I can solve. Is there anyone who has resources, not the government, who might be able to give us funds? Is there someone who might be willing to come in as, as patients? So Bridge is a project we're working on uh, with Ashoka and between, uh, I'm an Ashoka fellow, one of the social entrepreneurs. So between Sage and Ashoka, um, there are a number of projects that we're doing. So I'm going to end uh, with that, and um, I'll, I'll talk about these later, and just go to this slide and open up. Um, so I think, uh, this, is in, this is in the Wall Street Journal, um, nice article, you can go back and look up by, um, about, I think Michael Nielsen uh, also uh, was involved with this. Um, and I think the real question is, um, are we ready, okay, to start living in a different way? Do we have to you know, go, oh, I'm not going to be the first person. Who's the leading edge? That's why I'm here today. Let's have some questions. <laughs> Particularly the skeptics. That's really what I want. No, no, seriously. Um, as before, for the purposes of the video, I'm going to try to get the microphone to you so we can pick up your comments and questions for the video, OK? So uh, who's, who's burning to kick it off? Another way of doing the kickoff is to say, I, I, you went so fast, I didn't know what you were saying. And I want you to go back and go either to um, one of the components or to those examples, which is really, I think, a, a good chance to, to dig in. So, Well, Stephen, yeah. I'll, I'll start one, just start yeah. a thread to see if it goes anywhere. Um, you were mentioning the shift in the recognition systems uh, as, a, as an integral part of what you're trying to put yep. together. Uh, one of the challenges I see at Berkeley and other leading academic institutions is uh, the problem of the race to be first to a result. And then the, whoever was that got there second or third uh, is often a, a footnote at best. Yep. And in terms of the prestige, the recognition, the follow-on grants, et cetera, uh, a lot of rewards accrue to uh, the first. And so there's a kind of a winner-take-all kind of an effect. By focusing on, look what I did, uh, not what I said or sponsored mm. or yep. structured, you're trying to create a different kind of an incentive mechanism. Maybe you could elaborate more on both the, the traditional incentive mechanism that I described and the one that you're trying to build. Yeah. Um, so I think the um, incentive structure that I'd say is uh, existing now is um, one based on the finish line. Di, 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 pat, that's, that's what you're referring to. So who, who got pat the, to the finish line uh, first? Um, if you go and you look at uh, GitHub, and you look at the reward structures that are there, and you look at 
even more importantly, if, you're, if you just are about to start a biotech company, who do you want in your, your uh, group? Who, who, who are you willing to, to pull in? Um, what you want, actually, is the person who knows how to do the key steps. <laughs> and until there is a way to have transparency and a way of having annotation and giving recognition to an intermediate uh, step, it's very hard to shift away from the cross the finish line first mentality. So I think until now, there's not been a way to um, have those intermediate uh, signals of, of uh, robustness. And so I think we have to build and see whether that will work the way it has worked in, in some other areas. Uh, you said that, uh, you know, uh, you give an example, you pour the water and the water goes through and let others dip into it and develop their own IP. But uh, the pouring the water, who's, who's funding that? The, yeah. the pipeline, yep. I mean, and who yeah. is incentive so to do so? For the Autism Schizophrenia Project, both of them, um, we know that you have to take six to eight targets forward to get one or two to work. So that effort costs per project on average $25 million. So we have to put together between 150 and $200 million for, a fi for five years. Okay? We think that if you do a single project, no one's going to say, oh, you were just lucky, or so, so we think you have to have basically start down a new mechanism, like for autism. And the way we've set that funding up is we have found um, countries who are willing to match pharma dollars dollar for dollar. And what we're doing now is finding three lead pharma companies who are willing to say, I'm willing to put in, actually, if they put in under two million a year, they can for those five years. We can structure that in a way that all that work will get done. So um, what they have to believe is that they have a unfair advantage. That's what they need for being able to choose which targets go forward, look at how they progress, get that information before it's in the public domain. So they're they're actually sitting there working in the stream before others. And they're sitting there running their internal program, chemists, assayists, and ramping it up or down depending upon what they see in the stream. The public won't see it till a little later. It will come out so everyone sees it. But you see how we've, we've set it up? So they have an advantage, but at two million a year, they shouldn't have too big an advantage. <laughs> That's nothing for them, relatives. I was just wondering what what would success look like for your for for Sage like in the in uh, one year and three years out and yeah so five time. years out um, and I'm quite serious and I've been uh, is um, that people forgot who we were right one of the big mistakes people places make is to think they have to get to here to here to here right so um, there was a slide that I will uh, zip back to. Maybe too slow to do this way, which um, showed you something that uh, I'm sorry. So um, that uh, shows you why I say that. Um, if we can't build a system where, uh, like the internet, um, there's not someone who is still uh, managing the flow. Ah, here, this is this. Okay, so we're working on new tools, pilots, platforms, rules, and new maps. Right? If we haven't been able to show that uh, new maps are worth something then we should stop making them. The new tools, we hope as people get into it, they'll be able to build more. Um, the pilots, good example, this uh, federation strategy, we now have groups saying, I want to use that federation strategy. I don't want to join yours, but I want to do it in my own area. So I think the concept is to actually build a culture where people are allowed to work in this way. Don't think that you uh, need to be um, uh, continuing to shape it. Our idea is put it out in a weak way, you know, a weak, flexible way, and let it evolve, uh, not, not try to be. Uh, when time is of the essence in fighting, for example, battles like uh, bacteria gaining resistance towards antibiotics, how important do you think your solution is in a when you're enabling people to open up to see the, the common solution in, in, yeah. fighting, uh, mm. in finding new ways or actually altering the, the disease and not just treating the symptoms? 
Um, I'll answer that uh, with the following example. Uh, last spring, so it's almost a year ago, do you remember the problem that came up with the vegetables in Germany and the outbreak of the um, diseases um, that went on there and then it went around the world like that? Um, when there is an outbreak and something like that, speed is like essential. <laughs> And uh, the whole concept, I think you got it, is that if you give one person responsibility, you're in charge of generating the data and you're making the models, that's linear. That's not a good idea when you're trying to do something for speed. So I think the debate that I can tell, um, I can tell when an audience is like, okay, and now I'm getting it enough that I'm mad, okay? So, so you're not mad yet, so I don't think you're getting it uh, enough, um, seriously, is, do you realize that this is uh, really pushing on a classical system about intellectual property right? and, and, and who owns what? Okay? I don't know if you see it, but, um, and so uh, someone who's trying to gain a particular advantage for commercializing a company that's building an assay doesn't want to share that. But the society needs it. And so I think there is a um, tension, there should be a healthy tension in society between what do you need to um, drive innovation, okay? And I'm going to argue that IP in a block use does not. And, and I, I bring that up because I go to some countries, um, in Asia uh, particularly, uh, where IP is still king, right? We tried to form a f uh, nonprofit in China, and they said, um, you, we, we can't, you cannot form a nonprofit. We don't have nonprofits. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what Mao Zedong would have said. Um, that, um, seriously. Um, but, so we decide, okay, it's a for profit company then, <laughs> but we're just not going to make any money. <laughs> so so the, 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 the point, I went off track a little bit, but the point I was trying to make was I think that actually, if speed is, is in essence, and I would argue, you know, Every day, I forget what the number is, um, there's like you know, 10,000 people dying of cancer. Okay? There are ways to get medicines made faster. Okay? We are not living in a world where that's done. We should hold ourselves responsible for being participants in that system instead of saying, right, that's not on our walk. You talked about two collaborations. Um, could you explain those two? One is open to all and how practical is it? to have the open to all uh, collaboration is, is, will that work? Uh, you know, because the society seems to be a little more protective of the, uh, yeah. the IP and so So on. I think what I was referring to is on, uh, and I, I think, tell me if this is where I was speeding. Um, GitHub, I said, you can have two types of collaboration. The same applies on, on Synapse. One is where you define your favorite group of collaborators and you share among four or five people and that is fine. I mean, if you think that's what you need to get something done, um, and that's the team like at Microsoft. That's the way it uses GitHub, and I expect companies will use Synapse that way. But if you really want a problem that's a big problem to be worked on, I don't think you take that approach. If what your real interest is, can I solve the problem? Okay, um, I think Alf uh, Bingham was here a week yeah. or two ago. What would Alf say? You put it out there. <laughs> Um, one of the things I didn't talk about is that that real names Parkinson project, those three projects that I had um, with IBM, what we're doing is taking those data sets, the patient data sets that we're building, and we're putting them out and saying anyone in the world who thinks they can solve this problem can go ahead and solve that problem. So we're, the real Parkinson project will be a set of data. There's a project on breast cancer that we put out there. Um, so this is, um, let me a little backdrop. Ten years ago, I helped uh, in a project that um, turned into a, one of those Nature New England Journal articles on can we find a classifier for young women with breast cancer, no lymph node involvement, who's going to get aggressive disease? So we did that project. We put the IP out there. Two companies uh, uh, took it on, Oncotype DX in the U.S., uh, Mama Print in Europe. They charged $3,000 a piece. So we decided, you know. I think we can do a better classifier now, and why does it cost that much? <laughs> so this project is to actually put out this very large set of data and let anyone in the world build a classifier, but they have to say how they built it. 
And so that's a project which, by being open, now the, right, is going to get done a lot better than choosing one team to work it. So I think um, probably uh, Alf went into this. Collaborative challenges are an interesting concept where you, uh, this is like the X Prize, where you say, I'm starting for something, it's a big project, you get to a certain part in the project, and then you allow teams to uh, um, rejoin. Um, if um, Kareem Lakani, um, had given his talk. He's doing some really good work at, at Harvard. One idea I had was actually to tell him that you're videoing him, but no one show up, okay? Just video it, okay? Then you get the lecture from him, they get your lecture, and the students get both. So no one said in the class, I want A and B, right? Let's get uh, Kareem to give us a okay? He said he would, right? But you don't have to necessarily, just tell them to, to video it, and then you can drop it in the box, and still they get you live. So I'd go for A for B plus B. So a quick comment on uh, your point about ALF, and then we'll take some more comments. Um, one of the things that I think you're adding to what we saw from ALF is that in the uh, Innocentive system, the independent parallel problem solving that goes on, uh, there isn't communication between uh, the, the solvers. You actually have mechanisms exactly. to expose right. progress uh, among solvers to one another, right. and your, your GitHub analogy is that we can all see who's contributing what right. and give uh, recognition to those people even as this collaborative effort proceeds yep. forward without having to wait till we get to the end point exactly. and assign all the credit and all the recognition right. at the end point. That's right. And just while you're doing the transition, so I'm going to go back here. Um, on, uh, you can write this down. April 2021 20, in the Bay Area, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, by an invite only 200 people uh, come together. So the uh, editor for Wired and a bunch of people get together. We're going to have a conference in, uh, sorry, San Francisco um, called the Sage Congress. And the reason I'm putting it up is we're going to televise that um, and archive. Oh, you, you just went past it. Um, actually, it could have. Could have. Um, I think actually, I'll show you where it is. There it is. Um, so um, if you go on here, um, this is a conference on, you know, are you going to live in this world or that world? And um, this is, you can go on and look at the agenda, but I'm bringing it up because Adrian Truel, who is the person who built the uh, system at Carnegie Mellon, they got 54,000 authors on a nature paper. So he crowdsourced a problem that couldn't be solved by the crystallographers. And the lead woman who actually figured this out was a mother of three living in like Surrey, England, who became, outdid all the postdocs at Berkeley, other places in crystallography. Um, uh, so um, he is giving uh, one of the keynote addresses at this, uh, at this uh, uh, lecture, or at this uh, Congress. Yeah, um, one question uh, to sort of balance the, the general enthusiasm. Uh, interested to hear about. Everybody likes to share the credit. What about sharing the blame? Because things will go wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you take the neutrino faster than the speed of light, I bet there are a bunch of people at, at CERN now not being bought coffee or drinks by their mates because you know they're saying it's not us; it's 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 them or whatever. Yeah. So you, that then means Absolutely. audit, audit and architecture. And how do you yeah. reconcile that with yeah. a team spirited collaborative environment? Yeah. Um, so, actually, I think there are two really important questions that you brought up. Um, one, uh, which was the equivalent of uh, credit blame in the team, and the other is quality of the data. I mean, in some ways, you, you brought them together, but they're, they're two, two separate. And I think that um, the, uh, um, I forget what the number is, but it's something like four out of every five papers you go to take what someone did and you try to repeat it does not repeat. So I always like it when people go, oh, well, why would I ever trust what citizens would do if they were being asked questions? They don't know what they're doing, okay? And then you go, well, when scientists write their papers, how often are you able to reproduce it? L let's be generous and say less than half the time uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, reproduce the way it is. So I think um, the um, uh, team has to take that responsibility in the same way. And where something has failed on GitHub, right, or where it was built to do something, you don't want to be associated with that. So, so the blame, I think, has got to go to a, a, an attribution, right, a micro attribution level. But then on the quality of the data, what we've assumed is that all data is of no value when it enters, no matter who it comes in from. And that 
similar to the Amazon Reader's Advantage, if you've done a project that actually worked out, then someone annotates, there's a data set that I used for this purpose. It may not work for another. So this is done because otherwise someone could go and tip the whole system over by logging in all this fraudulent data and, and sort of trying to mess people's models up that way. So the way to avoid that is to put it in at a neutral re rating and, and let it build over time. So I, the thing you said at the end about the fraudulent data is actually very interesting. Um, I don't have a question about that, but um, that was something I was thinking about, whether you would end up with sort of sabotage. Um, I think we were discussing, and it's something that keeps coming up, is the necessity of um, really that assigning value over the course of the project is probably the critical thing, because we're talking about like being able to convince our PI that, well, we think this other companies, they're, they're very close to publishing on this and stuff, but we really, we, th we should collaborate with them. We should help them get there. Um, and just h how difficult it is going to be to break that mold, especially for like, academia is just so traditional. Um, yeah. um, so actually, how far the program are you? we're second year students. Yeah, yeah. So it's not too late. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you were like in your fourth year or something, you, you, this would be a very real personal mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think that it um so um what I would go to is um Doug Melton. Okay, so you can look him up. So Doug Melton I knew at uh, Harvard and he was a classic academic. <laughs> um Good chance that he may uh, get to park in one of those Nobel laureate uh, parking places. Done absolutely brilliant work in uh, stem cells. Um, and um, he had one way of working until his daughter got diabetes. And when it got personal, <laughs> when it got into the family, then you go, why am I living this way? So I think that we have to count on people who lives have been touched and um, they're going to be a rare uh, set until others are ready to live that way. But I think if you were sitting next to a patient, if there was a way to, so this didn't go off into the uh, whatever cyber cafe, but to get here you had to walk down a hospital corridor to get to your uh, class here. Um, be, I, remember, I spent a number of years as a pediatric oncologist. That is a hard job. Okay? The amazing thing is you get energy. I had more energy when I would do eight hours in the clinic and come to the lab than I would from uh, going out and getting a good night of sleep. And I think people don't realize that energy is out there. And so I think that you have to wait till there are examples uh, of pioneers that are willing to do something like that. And when it works, it's, I think it's going to be pretty obvious, and then other people are going to go. So I think it's uh, like everything in innovation. It's find the leading edge. Don't try to solve for the laggards. <laughs> And to answer your question, I don't know whether there's enough to get that leading edge. I think it's really, there is a chance that that uh, closed medical information system goes worse. I'm going to give you a scenario by which I think it could go worse. Um, the companies that are generating the DNA information are realizing that their technology is headed towards being a commodity. If you look at the price of Affymetrix and what happened to it, if you look at where Illumin is and where it's going to go, Companies that develop new technology have a narrow span when they are able to charge too much. Then, when that shifts, they have to come up with a new business model. A logical business model would be to say, um, I'm going to charge half as much for data that you allow me to uniquely own after I make it for you. That's how close, so there's a, an author, Tim Wu, you should look up uh, closed uh, information. It has nothing to do with medicine. Closed information system. Nice book that came out two or three years ago. And I'm worried that the, at the same chance that there is to actually go the right direction, that um, there are people who are going to begin to go, God, if I could take all that information from insurers, or insurers decide that, or someone else decide it, um, why would I ever share that? Because I can make a lot of money off of that. So I think um, I'm not confident that it necessarily will go in the right direction. I think that, that's why I said I like to talk to uh, um, in rooms like this, because 
This is not something we're going to do. If this isn't something you're going to do, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so it's got to be people who are in their second or their fourth year that go, you know, this is an odd world we're living in, and maybe um, we uh, uh, should acknowledge that. Oh, sorry. My perspective will be as a mixed. From a business perspective, um, it would seem to me that you'd be able to jumpstart this program if you could give an advantage to the participants of this program, like FDA accelerated approval. Something like that. Have you talked to Congress? Yeah, yeah it's really that? good. Yes. In fact, I spent last week, I, I um, do work with the people from the FDA, and that's a really uh, good uh, concept you came from. Um, for the um, two projects that we're working on, the one I talked about early about the clinical trial comparator arm project, um, and the one I talked about later, the ARCH to POCM, there are ways to say that companies who uh, participate in this have some uh, advantage in terms of life of patent. I mean, there are things that are under control of the FDA, to your point, it's a really important one. And I think we have to find those uh, to, 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 to bring an incentive. Problem I have with um, going out and sort of making that a broadcast is then nobody talks to you until they're granted that. So if, if we go, do you know what I mean? So, so we've got to try to get this going <laughs> and not say, Here's what's in it for you from that standpoint, because if we can't come through with that, that is hard. So this is just from, from the art of putting things together. Um, there's a couple of things that are worth having in your uh, back pocket. That's a good example of one. I think it makes a lot of sense from the academic perspective how you can easily distribute the credit to different people and they're kind of getting acknowledgement. But can you talk more about once industry gets involved, how you distribute that credit so that these corporations can actually monetize it going forward, especially since they might be competing against some of the other corporations that are also involved in a project? Yeah. Um, uh, so. Um, I like it, just so you know, each of these questions are getting better and better, so I'm glad it's not ending in five minutes. No, I'm not that the first one wasn't, but all I'm saying is we're getting into better questions <laughs> now, so um, this one is a good one, because um, what you caught me on was uh, two types of reward. One is you, d you did not ask me how is it that inside that company is someone rewarded. That's easy to answer. Okay? You asked the harder question, which was, what is it in the, uh, how can the co company ensure that it's getting a benefit when it's, so um, I had, when I was at uh, Merck, did three or four, I'm always trying to do trials, so I did, or pilots, I did three or four uh, times where I got two companies that had phase one drugs to actually do a combined project before they knew what they were working. You can look it up, it's the AstraZeneca example. Um, uh, I got BMS to give all of their imaging files in oncology, all of them, to Merck, if Merck would give them all the way back to BMS. Um, we set up a program in Asia where we wanted to study gastric cancer. None of the companies wanted to pay all the amount. And so in that instance, we said, three companies, let's split the cost. You go over there, and you all get it, but no one else gets it. So in, there's a common element in all those. There has to be an advantage to the company to, to do it. Okay. There, so, so to your point, there has to be. So the question is, how do you build that? So it have, I'd have to go to the example, but I'm going to go to the two that I gave specifically. For the clinical trial comparator arm project, when they enroll a trial currently, they know that the patients are heterogeneous, but they have to treat them as if they're all identical. If they can go in and share data that they all had on a previous trial that this is a project we're doing for next year on rheumatoid arthritis. And we knew who does does not respond to anti-TNF therapies. And they share that data. Then they, who, who work together like that, have an ability to, to enroll into the trial a subset of patients which make that trial cheaper to them. So you have to give them a, a specific benefit <laughs> that comes on that. On the ARCH to POCM, they have to feel as if by looking at the stream before other people look at it, that they can move up and down their own internal efforts and, and uh, beat others by what they're doing, or they're not. They, they have, so the important is companies are not interested in giving away advantage, only in gaining an advantage. So the only way you set up sharing 
is where they feel as if they get a benefit. And the interesting thing is that most companies think they're better than the other. So if you let them all see something, they go, we have better chemists, we have better biologists, it's worth it to us. So does the next, so, but that's okay, right? But if they feel that, right, then they will uh, do that. So, so you've, right, you've got to find that little edge. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment on the question about Congress and policy. Uh, I think there may be some interventions uh, short of a quote unquote act of Congress that could help move some of this forward. Uh, one example would be in reimbursement for new drugs when much of the research behind the drug was publicly financed through the National Institutes of Health, et cetera. And yeah. you might imagine uh, some sort of a reimbursement mechanism that said, okay, we're go we'll reimburse at this rate, but by the way, uh, the successful amount of money you spent on the drug was about 10 or 15 percent of the total program cost. The other 80 or 85 percent was on preclinical or failed comparator kinds of studies. If you publish that, we will reimburse at a higher rate uh, so that there becomes a positive incentive to share information that would actually then help create more of an intellectual commons, which is, I think, the underlying, yep. uh, if you're trying to take one meta takeaway from all this, is if we can enrich the commons of information that's available for uh, academic research all the way through to new drug development, we could accelerate the time to market, we could reduce the risk, we could increase the effectiveness, and so on and so forth. So some fairly small uh, mechanisms in reimbursement might be an interesting way to mm. create some of the momentum to get this, because in, in most studies of new drug development, uh, about a typical assumption is it's a billion dollars, give or take, for a new drug, but only about a hundred million of that is actually spent on the candidate that actually is the one that makes it through to the market. The other nine hundred million dollars in the program Absolutely. is spent on all the other stuff. And all that other stuff currently, for many of the reasons that Stephen alluded to, is hoarded, yeah. is, well, is kept inside. Yeah. It's not making money for the company, but it's not being shared with anybody else either. So, so that's the yeah. big, uh, the big low-hanging fruit. I think is to take not yeah. not to reduce the incentive for the hundred million dollars that turn into a successful drug, but to reclaim some of the value in the nine hundred million dollars uh, that is right, is currently going nowhere right now. It's sitting on shelves, moldering someplace. Yeah. So here's something to tweet on. Um, a year ago, I um, was interested in doing a project that said. Why don't we um, make companies uh, have t uh, two options? One is um, that they uh, share the data on their failed compounds, and they get to charge the price that assumes that uh, the money that they need to raise is to cover their failed and their successful compounds. Or you tell companies that they need to only charge for the research that it took to build the successful company if they don't want to share their failed compounds. And I went to people that will remain nameless at a big white building in Washington. And I uh, went to uh, uh, people in, in industry and the FDA. And that sensible idea was completely shot down. And why? Because it's not in people's necessarily in their interest. I think it's in the interest of the public. If you think about it, why are our citizens reimbursing for, you know, when they pay for a drug, the failed compounds if, if we're not allowed to look at what it is that didn't work? So that is something right, that was a little too radical. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is actually if citizens and patients begin to be our partners. I think this is about getting out of the uh, medical industrial complex. We have friends out there, <laughs> patient citizens, who would actually come together with us to work on things like that. Um, it's not gonna come from uh, uh, um, uh, working by ourselves. So I know you mainly focus on the medical sector, but I'm really curious of, uh, you said you know you have a, philo a philosophical background, so applying this to uh, the larger mm -hmm. um, intellectual property Thanks. scheme at large. So. Um, well, why don't you just keep the mic and say what you think would happen? 
Like, because I think it's the the medical. Let me just say, and then I'm, I'm interested in hear what you said. So what I'm saying is, right now, the uh, the assumptions I'm making is we have a closed medical information system. People are rewarded for not sharing, and uh, research is going at a linear pace. That is not in the interests of uh, patients. That's the argument. <laughs> so. In order, if, if patients had their way, they would say those things need to change. So I think you would have to ask, is there another information system that has that uh, contour that actually um, going beyond medicine um, might, might benefit from, from being open? And there I, I, I would think that you know, probably anyone in the room well, right, together will come up with a better answer than mine. <laughs> but can you think of another, do you see what I'm saying? Is, is there another parallel uh, uh, industry where information is closed for the for the benefit of, of some. Just, 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 has, it, has it worked? A friend of mine until quite recently was running a, a, a silicon foundry, which was a collaborative foundry, where what was being shared was all the soft, all, all the semiconductor know-how to a high degree, and where the specificity of what people were doing with particular devices or particular chips or whatever that was down to the individual individual teams, but was a huge uh, general. It, it seems like in, in uh, sp specifically pharma, there is like a very dedicated pipeline, whereas in some other areas, it's kind of like there's all this activity and then uh, people are able to synthesize it into different products. Whereas, again, like the, the research, you can, you can use that model where you're actually pouring this central stream. Right. So that's, that, that seems like the difference, um, a difference. Yeah, um, let me go to one slide here that I, I assume you know, but if you haven't seen it, this is helpful. Um, so uh, the um, another way of, of framing what I think you just said is that the so so right now it's uh, I think the newest numbers are three to twenty billion dollars for an approved drug. Okay, three to twenty billion dollars. Okay, this is the Tufts numbers updated. Uh, most of it. it used to be about a billion, then it was two. Now it's three to twenty. Right? And if you ask why that happens, it's because of probability of successes that are at about probability of success, which is about ten percent in going through early discovery, preclinical, and phase one. So you add that up, it's one in ten thousand efforts that start. Right? And the problem is that when people are working back here, they dream that they have a billion dollar molecule. And, they, and they, the way that they function as, um, in terms of relationships is as if the thing's already worth a billion. That's fundamentally, to me, the problem with why the system uh, works so, so poorly. If you, if you really had a billion dollar molecule, you shouldn't be sharing it. <laughs> I agree. But it's not worth that. <laughs> and I think getting that understanding and having people realize that, that's where the de-risking helps. Uh, so I don't know if that helped. So this is sort of jumping back. The mic is louder this time. Um, has Sage actually considered, sort of as a side project or even through somewhere else, um, lending specific support to the push for global electronic medical records and the United States as a way to change the culture, especially of the citizens? Because I feel like right now, especially, you said people who have a disease yep. are willing to share, but. Yep. Um, we've gone the other direction. That is something to think about. Um, um, let me tell you what we've done, then we go to electronic medical record. Um, so we think at the heart of it has been, um, and again, time will tell what all the pieces are. You know, when, Whenever you are working on something, you have to assume the really important thing you have yet to come on, and I think that's the way we feel also. So anyone who's working on innovation, you have to assume, even if you've got the most coherent descriptor in the world, the chance that actually you've 
got all the pieces, you have to assume you're missing the important one. So I, I will grant that. But what we've assumed is that until there was a compute space, there was no way to work together. Until you had a way to have that compute space, have uh, uh, micro-attribution, uh, people wouldn't uh, be able to get credit. So that's what we put on as the first element. The second was that um, uh, until you were allowed legally to share the data, nothing else could do. And that's where the portable legal consent has been the major effort. So along those lines, um, there's a, a campaign that now, um, interestingly, um, Google is interested in working on with us, which I think is interesting, um, which says, um, let's run a That's My Data campaign. <laughs> And let's wake up people to the fact that every time you give a sample, you don't get the data back. And why can't we get to the point where uh, the same way you have a driver's license and your driver's license says, um, I'm a donor, right? You can take my heart. Why don't we put PLC on the driver's license? Why don't we have it so that ahead of time, people have said, I, if, you take, if you take a sample from me, <laughs> I want that data back. And so along those lines, what we've done is gone and found two hospitals, one in the US, one in Europe, that have said every patient coming through the door will run the portable legal consent on. We've gone to Europe, and we've found a uh, foundation there, and actually one of the states that said every single patient in the world who has this disease is going to sign this. <laughs> so if people start wanting to do work on us, yeah, that's the way to do it. But one of them, there's only 700 patients. So we're working with the Fanconi Anemia Society, being a pediatric oncologist, bone marrow failure. Um, there are more people working on the disease than there are patients. So I thought, this is a good dough one to try this out on as a, uh, as a test. Um, but, um, I, uh, uh, but I think we have to, um, uh, I think getting it to the point where it's possible to share the data and there's a place to put it is uh, important. Electronic medical records. Remember, electronic medical records were uh, put in by hospitals who want to charge. Okay? It's a billing system. It doesn't tell you really what's going on with the patient. It's a way of coding for charging. And there's very important information in there, but if all that were to open up today, Every electronic medical record was able to be so instantly shared and, and be there. I don't think it would do as much good as having some other things that are, that are there. So I think we, we've not put our, our energy, even though I think it would be valuable to do. I'm wondering about the computer systems that we have. Do they, do they have the capability of... Okay. Do they have the capability of handling the data and then doing the computation that I assume yeah. you're going to need to do? Yeah. And what, what systems are, are you contemplating using? Yeah. So um, that's where we started uh, going to um, cloud structures because there is a lot of data. But the good news is that the price for storing data in the cloud just keeps going down. And when you go, so this is the area called big data. This is about working with big data. And so a reframe your question is, how big is the big data from the closed medical information system? And the answer is, it's smaller than what NSA has. <laughs> amount of data that's being collected on all of us all the time. We don't begin to touch the NSA data. Right? It's probably going in some. Right, it's probably going into Langley from from some video camera. Um, I'm going to invite one final question after I make a comment to perhaps uh, spur our imaginations even a little further. Although we've been taken quite far today from uh, what Stephen has shared with us, uh, today is uh, Apple announced that they've now had 25 billion downloads of apps for their phones. And if you think about what an app is. It's just a, way, a lightweight way of looking at some mm. data or providing some organization of data to give you an experience or provide a service to you on this device. Um, and 25 billion of them have been downloaded now. If you had some of the kinds of information that we've talked about today, and that was available and open for lots of people to look at, imagine the apps that could be generated mm. to uh, promote health and well-being, uh, first and foremost among patients who have unmet medical need, but even then in our daily lives. 
um, things that we could be tracking uh, that would help us be, be healthier, uh, more awake, uh, less sleepy after lunch, or all kinds of things. Um, and that no, no one uh, person architected that system. That, that was a very dynamic, complex, very open, albeit controlled in the case of Apple, uh, for who gets in, system. Uh, and it's had a huge uptake as a result. Uh, and it's allowed each of us to have very personalized experiences of what we want. Um, that's a much simpler problem than what we're articulating here. But if you think about that as a vision for the potential of what's on offer, uh, it gets genuinely very exciting, I think. So any, any final comments or, credit, or questions? Actually, can I ask a question or two to the group? Uh, so just raise your hand on these. Uh, I distract these. Um, one is, um, so if you had uh, a way to um, get your whole genome sequence done for free, how many people would do it today? OK. Um, put your hand down, OK, if you would, uh, would want that to be kept to yourself, right? So if you, wanna, if you could want to let others see it, leave your hand up. OK, I'm just interested in that. Yeah. Um, one thing we've looked at for business models, I thought I'd get this question, so I just want to put this in, is um, build, how do you build apps on this uh, IT platform? So what we've been thinking of is the internet, right, is something that's the framework on which things work. And uh, so um, there's a project uh, by a physicist named Francois Gray, who's in uh, China, he's in Beijing, and he has gotten the government in China to fund an open science lab. You can go and look at it in the, in the lab. Open science lab in China, where uh, mobile phones allow you to take 100,000 or more people who are tracking things they care about <laughs> and feed it in to something that they're uh, uh, trying to collect. They've done nothing on health. We're working on a project to see why can't we use that app device phone portable to start collecting and seeing if we can build some, uh, some maps on that. So, but the po major point I wanted to get to was that I think that apps could get built on this platform and that is a business opportunity. So. Um, if you build this on the on Synapse or that, that people could use as a tool, people would uh, download it. Imagine a world in which, when you take a, a medicine, right? Any of you take a medicine that uh, you would report if something happened to you. Right? No, no one tracks after a drug is approved what happens. Imagine every time you had a reaction, there was a way to collect that information and start building that up. And those who'd raised their hands had their genomic information. The cost to find out what's going on goes up to almost zero at that point, right? So if you don't have to pay to go out and do everyone's genome sequence, and you actually had citizens who say, I'm going to tell you what happened to me, and you already have people willing to do their, uh, so that's the world we're going to be living in. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you so much. Okay, next week, uh, open innovation, uncut. Uh, and where, where did my attendance sheet end up? Oh, thank you. Okay, good.